Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the OSINT Plus live stream here on the wonderful SANS uh, accounts on LinkedIn, YouTube, and on Twitter. I'm Michael Hoffman. I am the host of these events, and we do them monthly. And I'm thrilled to have with me some of my amazingly talented colleagues in OSINT and also in the offensive security area of cyber. Uh, first off, let's introduce uh, Nico Dakins. Nico, um, why don't you say hi and tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Hi, Nico Dakins. Um, over 20, 20 years experience in counterterrorism, everything that has to do with open source intelligence within the Dutch law enforcement, and uh, currently pretty proud to be a co-author of the SANSEC 537. So. Um, yeah, that being said, basically everything I do uh, is eat, sleep, and breathe open source intelligence. All right. Thanks, Nico. Nico's a good friend of mine. Uh, some of you probably know him from the OSINT Curious Project or many of the talks that he's given in the open source intelligence world. Nico and I are going to be forming the OSINT team portion of this conversation. And on the offensive security, red team, pen test team, we have some amazing people. Uh, we'll start out with Josh Wright. Josh, uh, thanks for being on. Thanks, Micah. Thanks for having me, and, and hello to everybody. Uh, I'm Josh. I am a faculty fellow with SANS. I'm also a technical director for CounterHack, where we do penetration testing, expert witness work, and other cybersecurity-related areas. I'm also the author of SANS Security 504, which is Hacker Tools, Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Handling. And just uh, looking forward to chatting with everybody here today. I think this is a uh, the most social interaction I've had in a while. Looking forward to it. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Tim, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are? Great. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Tim Medine. I am. Uh, I work for and founded and run whatever a uh, company called Red Siege. We focus on all the offensive things, so pen testing, red teaming, things uh, along those lines. I'm also the lead author for uh, SANS 560, the uh, network penetration testing course. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And John Gornflow, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, man. John Gornflow. I've been doing information security since about 2006. I didn't realize it until 2008, but that's that's another story, I guess. <laughs> uh, um, got into it, uh, accidentally took a job as a network administrator, and eventually, I, and I think it was somebody through SANS, I don't even remember who, but kind of asked the question of, if we know that the bad guys can get around all of your security tools and whatever, how do you know they're not already in your network? And as a relatively competent system and network administrator that like planted this splinter in my mind and I haven't found the bottom of that rabbit hole yet, but uh, yeah. OSINT yeah, but is uh, definitely a part of that. Well, and that's one of the, the amazing things about uh, cyber and OSINT and many of the other tech fields out there is that it doesn't stop. You know, it's not like you've learned everything. Okay, we're done. It's always continuing. Um, just a little bit more about me. I am a SANS senior instructor. I'm the author of the SANS uh, SEC 487 OSINT class. Uh, I am the president of the OSINT Curious Nonprofit. And I do a whole bunch of other things in the OSINT and cyber communities. So today, um, one of the things I want to do is I want to just let you know a little bit about the platform so that you can help be a part of the conversations. Um, we are live streaming on YouTube, on Twitch, I mean, YouTube, Twitter, and Periscope and on LinkedIn. And I see that a whole bunch of you are, are sending in your comments of welcome and hellos from all around the world. That is incredible. And that's exactly what we want you to do. This is a live stream. This is not a web webcast. So we want you to be part of the conversation. So uh, use your comments fields in whatever platform you're on to type in your information that you want us to maybe talk about or maybe want to um, just uh, add to the conversations. Now, today, we're going to be focusing on open source intelligence. Nico, do you want to give just a brief overview of open source intelligence for our audience? Just because I know that we're coming from cyber, we're also coming from other uh, disciplines. You want to tell them a little bit about open source intelligence? Yeah, sure. So um, long story short, open source intelligence is all about gathering and analyzing information coming from open source so they need to be publicly available uh, sources. So uh, in essence, uh, I always like to refer to them, your neighbor, your mother, your daughter should be able to find them if they know what they are doing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily also have 
to mean that it has to be internet information. It can be a TV station, radio, newspaper, library, as long as it's publicly accessible. That's open source intelligence. Cool. Thanks, Nico. So my history, I, I actually grew up in the cybersecurity world and doing penetration testing. And I remember, I remember actually the time when I made that mental shift from, I love penetration testing of web pages to, I love OSINT. Uh, I was doing a penetration test and uh, one of the steps in our reconnaissance portion of the, the engagement was always to Google the name of the web application if it was on the internet. So I literally went to Google, typed in the name of this, this web application that I was preparing to hack. And I found a, a PDF document written by the developers. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll read this document. It was a help page. And it's like, if you want to get into the application in this field, enter your username like this one, enter your password like this one. I was like, all right. So I literally <laughs> took that username and password and I was into the system I'm like this is hacking. <laughs> so, um, John, why don't we start with you um, when you're doing well, the types of open the types of penetration testing and red teaming that you're doing? Um, what are some of the things that you're looking for to, and looking to find when you're doing that recon portion of your um, your assessment? Sure, sure. So, like, usually as a pen tester or red teaming, you've got some target that you're trying to get to. And beyond just like the target organization, there's certain data that is maybe critical to them or maybe a critical process that they really want to protect in one form or another. And so, um, I tell people when I teach pen testing is like during recon, you're really looking for one of two things as quickly as you can find it. And whichever one you find first will lead to the other. And the first is valid credentials. And the second is the ability to execute code on somebody else's computer, right? And if you can get one of those two things, it'll most likely lead to the other gathering enough information. So um, we focus a lot just on getting those things and those are usually they're out there somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, it, we just have to learn to dig deep enough to find it. And um, and that's where you kind of tie into just the, the technical background and understanding how all those systems fit back together and how they integrate. And when you do a little bit of that searching and, and reconnaissance side of things and have that uh, decent foundation of how all that stuff actually works, you can usually find some some way that they just didn't think that anybody would figure that out. And yeah, it's exactly. all out there somewhere. Well, and you're making those those guesses as to what their architecture is like and all those other things. Josh, Tim, have either one of you ever come across like in a recon phase uh, of an assessment, like the, a detailed blueprint of an application or something else like that, that you were like, aha, this is going to help me out shape the rest of my investigation? Definitely. Uh, uh, I was doing some work for... Um, uh, electrical generation and uh, transportation companies. And it was a big project on smart grid technology. And uh, we uh, worked on this project for a long time. And, you know, we, we were really in the weeds on understanding the technical aspects of these smart meters, how the meter on the side of a business or somebody's house connects to a metropolitan wide wireless network, the protocols they use, the, the communication mechanisms, things like that. And uh, a lot of that is just cloaked in mystery. Like, you know, yes, it uses wireless, but what are the frequencies? What are the modulation mechanisms? What are the encoding tools that are actually used to transport this information? You know, we, we didn't have that information until we started using OSINT tools. Uh, in this one engagement, we used the uh, license application page for the Federal Trade Commission, where all of this information was published for these products not just did they pass or fail the certification process for uh, the Federal Communication Commission, FCC, but also detailed schematics, uh, notes about wireless modulation mechanisms and, and everything that we needed to then build our own radios to be able to intercept and, and manipulate this activity as well. All the information was out there. You just needed to look and, and try to find the, the right thing that you really needed to succeed. That's terrific. And that's an excellent point there, Josh, that, you know, within the world of OSINT investigations, we're usually, and Nico, I know that you do a lot with, with uh, looking at high profile targets, looking for terrorists. Uh, I'm doing things with finding missing people. We're usually collecting data about people, 
and sometimes about IP addresses, websites, domains like that. But but Josh, I love that idea that that going online and using some advanced search skills to to figure out what's the architecture of this device, of this what things are happening in that location. That's amazingly powerful. Um, what about you, Tim? Some uh, times when you've uh, had some maybe interesting things that you found, you you do a lot of red teaming, right? Yeah, so we do a lot more on, on the that spectrum. Uh, we had one test. We were actually working with uh, another organization, but um, during the test, we were looking around trying to find you know what publicly available information is out there, and so, you know, so many of the times that you're going to find information, and it's 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 not useful. Right, and you got to sift through that to find the important piece. We found information that was marginally useful, ended up being even a, a hugely useful. So what happened is, uh, for this particular test, we found source code in GitHub, and we're like, okay, cool, it's in GitHub, and we started looking through the source code. Well, it turns out the way that this this whole test was structured, organization A was purchasing B, and they wanted a pen test as part of this to make sure that it, it wasn't terribly insecure. When they found out that all the source code was public, they dropped their offer price by $10 million. <laughs> that was a $10 million mistake by making the source code public. 10 million wow. bucks, right? Like we could retire yeah. with that. <laughs> like, and, it, and it's funny because we didn't even realize how significant it was. We're looking through the code trying to find this. And we, we didn't even really put that in as a, as a significant finding because we didn't find any vulnerabilities. But they're scrolling through like, wait, 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 back up. You, you found the code? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's on GitHub. Right. Wait, is it not supposed to be? Yes, but <laughs> no. So that wow. was interesting. Were you, Tim, were you working for the acquiring company? The company yes. doing the acquisition? Oh, yes. you were. So you saved them $10 million. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. We saved oh. them $10 million bucks, but it was a $10 million, I mean, they were thrilled, right? But the other company, the, the CEO of that was livid, right? Because, I mean, it was literally his... $10 million yes. lost by a footnote in a, a, a report, right? Like, <laughs> wow. It was it's like where it's like pen testing. It'd be great to like work on commissions sometimes, you know? Right. Well, <laughs> that would be great. On the call, it's like mute and die laughing and then come back <laughs> wow. straight face. Like, I, I don't know if working loss. for commission on a pen test would really drive the right kind of behavior that we're looking for in the industry. Probably though. Not. That, no. that might not <laughs> might right. turn it well at the end. <laughs> Well, but you know, Tim, that that brings up a great and great thought, uh, process idea there. That that sometimes when you find things, you don't have that context. You don't have that understanding of what this means. You're like, yeah, we have the source code. We didn't find any credentials in there, or whatever. You're looking deeper into it, and the people are like, wait, hold up, you actually found that on there, and it wasn't supposed to be uh, something that was public. I would imagine. So uh, understanding the significance of of what you find is very very interesting. Yes. Wow. Um, so for the audience, again, if you're joining us from LinkedIn, from Twitter, Periscope, or from YouTube, please go ahead and throw your comments into the, the chat there. If you have questions for our audience, we're going to focus on open source intelligence and OSINT types of questions. So if you have things, I see that somebody has a question about social engineering. Do any of you do social engineering? Have you done it in the past? And if so, Nico has. Nico, you want to tell us about the social engineering and how do you yeah. like prepare for that from an OSINT perspective? Is it different than if you're looking at a website? Yeah, well, basically for social engineering, you need to engage with either a system or uh, or someone. Uh, and in my case, it was mostly someone in my uh, counterterrorism days mostly. So first of all, I needed to find my target. So what I would need to do is do some reconnaissance about on where they are. So scavenging all kinds of social media platforms to make sure that that's my target and then craft my uh, sock puppet account or synthetic identity to be either a really pretty girl that wants to date that target or the other way around because that's, well, one of the best tricks or pretend to be someone in their inner circle that has the same interest and then slowly engage with them and start talking to get your way in into closed groups where they are planning certain campaigns or attacks or where sales are active. So yeah, I did that, but you need the ocean part to get into the more offensive part in this case, social engineering. So, let me ask John and Josh and Tim this. Um, one of the things that we, Nico and I are always talking about is, 
is how OSINT informs people to make better decisions. So in the case of, of doing reconnaissance for in support of a pen test, have you ever had a time where you, you do really good reconnaissance and that makes your pen test go so much easier? Uh, always, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the one of the lessons that we teach in the 504 class is really understanding the platform that you're working on. And in one of our uh, challenges, there is a, a command injection vulnerability where, by manipulating a server, the uh, attacker can run extra commands on the target system. And a lot of times I'll uh, be looking over somebody's shoulder or somebody will say, hey, I, I, you know, I think I'm there, but I can't get this to work. And I'll look at the commands they're running and they're running things like LS, ID, uname dash A, things like that. And then I'll ask the question, what's the target operating system that you're working with? And they said, well, it's Linux. And, and I'll look again, I'll say, are you sure? Um, you know, OSINT is the thing that uh, informs a lot of what goes on subsequently in a pen test. Now, sometimes it's basic information. What is the platform? Is this Windows? Is it Linux? Is it uh, some kind of a Lambda uh, AWS cloud service or, you know, any other number of different platforms in between? And, and having that insight up front will then inform all the later steps that we're going to do against that target system instead of just spinning our wheels even though the attack is successful, we're not getting a meaningful result because we don't know what the platform actually is that we're working on. OSINT yeah. helps us uh, get that information we need to be successful there. I remember one one uh, website I was uh, doing a penetration test on, and and this was before I I understood the power of OSINT and just was really scrimping on my my reconnaissance. And I'm running all these these types of SQL injection attacks, and 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 a senior pen tester came over and said, "What are you doing, Mike?" I said, "Well, I'm, I'm SQL injecting. I think I have this." He's like, "All right, so I see that you're running those MySQL commands. Yeah, good luck on that. That's a Microsoft SQL server." I'm like, well, how do you know that? It's like, well, did you do the recon? Oh, well, kinda, but um, but yeah, it's sometimes. I, I, I can't tell you the number of wasted packets I sent and the, the amount of wasted time that uh, went into that. Uh, but we learn, right? Yeah. Now, do you, go ahead. Oh, um, do you do any of you do like phishing or simulated phishing types of engagements? Tim, um, before you do the phishing, I know that everybody has their favorite templates, the, hey, you have an Amazon fax waiting or whatever. Do you, do you ever do like reconnaissance to find out about your targets before you do like maybe spear phishing attacks or something like that to make them even Absol better? Absolutely. Because I mean, if you can, if you send that same generic, right, like, and you know, there's illegal, there's legalities if I'm going to impersonate UPS or FedEx, uh, things like that. But if I can craft my fish or a phone call and it's very specific to that organization it's going to be more likely that someone clicks through um, we've had uh, great success for a couple of different ones where the company won you know a major award right whatever it might be and then say hey we're with a, a team that's coordinating the event can you confirm how many people are sitting sitting with a table are you going to come or not right like just no one is like there, there's absolutely zero sensitive information here right um but then, of course, they have to log in, and invariably, people just chuck credentials in. They're like, yep, we're totally going. There's nothing sensitive here. I mean, I have to log in, but that doesn't matter. Um, that is huge in crafting that. Also, with the payload piece, we had one that was I'm trying to remember when it was, but someone at their organization was doing some, some live streaming. And uh, we could look at their system tray and see a bunch of the software they were running. We're like, cool. They're running Dropbox and they're using uh, like semantic AV. And so we're like, okay, cool. We know we, have, we know what we have to bypass. Um, we have a good social engineering ruse where we're, we're impersonating this piece of software or something like that. So absolutely. I mean, I don't know how you can do a successful fish without solid reconnaissance. I, other than just, you know, throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall. You've got to, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, there's a the shotgun fishing approach where you're like, yeah, they'll click on one of these things. But if you really train, I mean, if you do the things like just looking at social media, what people are posting from inside of their workspace or using their work assets nowadays that, that people aren't necessarily in the office, um, it's incredibly, incredibly informative. Now, we have some questions that are coming in here. 
Um, one of them, uh, let's see, uh, let's see. So one of them was asking about commercial tools to perform reconnaissance versus free and open source. For me, I grew up with the SANS classes and I really am a big supporter of free and open source software. I know that that gets me a good amount of open source intelligence data. Um, do you all have a favorite like go-to website that it does OSINT for you or a favorite tool, whether it's free or commercial that you wanna uh, just mention, say, hey, this would be a good one for people to use? Any thoughts? We all use Spiderfoot. Spiderfoot? Uh, yeah. The free tool that's fantastic. There's a paid version there as well, right? That would depend on your volume of usage as to where you'd want to go with that and, and the pricing there. Um, uh, there's a lot of tools out there, though. Yeah. Uh, everything from Multigo to ReconNG to, um, uh, and a million others. I mean, search OSINT on GitHub and you'll find, you know, a thousand new ones, right? Yeah, yeah Foca is also a good one for Which pen one? testing stuff. So Foca, the Foca. Italian built tool. Yeah. yeah, metadata, nice. Yeah. I like it. Josh, do you have a, a go to tool whenever you're you're starting an engagement? I mean, even if it's just researching IPs and domains and websites. Uh, I like you use a lot of open source tools. Uh, I, I like uh, I do like Foca as well. I'm being very careful to pronounce it in a way that doesn't get me into trouble. I, I like to call it Foquita. It's a little little a uh, little easier to say, but um, okay. you know, and uh, you know, Spiderfoot is a fantastic tool, and I think a, a lot of these tools are great until you you know need to rely on them on a, a regular basis. You know, once you use Spiderfoot HX, the commercial version. Then the Spiderfoot open source tool is is hard to go back to. You know, Maltigo has a community edition, which is fantastic. You get a limited number of transforms for looking up and kind of building your data sets. And then once you go the commercial version, you realize that there's a lot more feature set, a lot more capability, it unlocks a lot of doors for you. So I think it, a lot of it really depends on your growth and maturity. I, I've got my own playbook that I use when we're on pen test, and it's not one tool. It's many tools, it's many websites, lots of different resources. And you know, when you do a lot of pen testing, you repeat these processes and you wanna to try to be efficient at it. So now we have forms that we fill out to collect all the information and to get all that stuff collected. And, and it comes from any number of different sources. I don't know if the commercial tools always outweigh the benefit of the open source tools. It really is a personal decision and a lot of it has to do with your volume and, and how much you need to do this kind of work. All right. Yeah, I do like that last comment. For me, m mostly when it comes to pay tooling, it's more about scalability and speed for me to get answers more quickly and then do that last analysis sift through. But yeah, with that comes a price tag. Well, and with that too, those automated tools, they're great, but you get a lot of data. Yeah. And, and like, you know, Spiderfoot can go off the rails and be like, hey, you're using O365. Cool. That's also Microsoft. Let me get all the contacts from Microsoft. And who's BGP to Microsoft? And you're like, whoa, stop. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> Well, and, and you know, that's one of the things that, that we hammer into our students' heads, Nico and I, about, about when you run a tool, and I remember Ed Scotus, the great Ed Scotus, how he always used to say, push button pen testers. Uh, I don't want people to just run a tool, take the output, and then put it in some report. And that really stuck with me. And, and sure enough, you know, we have in, in the open source intelligence world, open source data, information, than intelligence. And when you run a tool, you're getting, like Tim said, you know, you're getting all of these results and you have to go through them. You have to look for false positives and false negatives, which ones are accurate, which are validate data, um, all of that before actually using it. Um, so let me ask you this. There's a, a very distinct line in my book between the legality of doing open source intelligence versus penetration test. Pen penetration test, you've usually or worked with a specific customer and you have certain rules. Um, so it allows you to take the things that you've learned, like John, you were mentioning the, the credentials and actually use them. Whereas in the world of OSINT, that goes beyond what most of us are gonna do. Um, do you, can any of you talk to uh, and talk about the uh, the process, the kind of what you do in the OSINT, um, in the pen test and offensive security world to get that permission? Because 
I don't want people in the OSINT world thinking, hey, I can just grab somebody's breach data and then just start using it on the websites because that's a different situation. Can I, would one of you like to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, start, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. So, go ahead. I mean, I deal with this with, it, it's a big contracting issue, right? And and I think Nico probably has a very different perspective because the privacy um, and the legality around privacy is drastically different between the US and the EU. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it's about permission. Uh, also internally, like, hey, I'm getting permission from the company, but the company needs to, to also, to some degree, have an agreement that, hey, you're not supposed to be putting, posting sensitive information online. We, we will be looking for it. Uh, beyond that, too, there's also, you know, ethical pieces there, too. Like, just because you can, should you? Like what? Um, right, well, I mean, so, I mean, it comes back to phishing, right? One of the stances we had was absolutely under no circumstances will we do a fish surrounded COVID-19, um, right? And, and it goes, it's much broader. We want to make the organization better, do no harm. I think it goes back to, to one of the fishes, not to get too far off, but in December, GoDaddy did against their employees related yeah. to a bonus. They caused harm. You broke trust with the organization. Yeah, they found out the people are going to click through, but at what cost, right? Um, and, and, you know, if I'm finding out too much information and sensitive information, you know, some Joe Blow is having an affair, you know, I don't want to use that in my test. That's way not cool. Is it out there? Is it legal to use? I mean, that's a whole different discussion, but there's definitely some moral and ethical pieces with that as well. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I teach uh, some college level classes on uh, morals and, and ethics. And we talk about, um, you know, famous lessons from people like Immanuel Kant and the categorical imperative, which, which basically says, you know, uh, there's two questions to ask about ethics. Uh, is it generally acceptable for you to do a thing? And can everybody do it? Um, I, I think that we don't really talk enough about ethics and, and morals and, you know, ethics being the outside rules that govern how people are expected to behave and morals being whether I'm okay with that, my, my internal kind of compass and deciding on that stuff. And so it, a lot of that will depend on um, the, the engagement, the nature of the information, but there's not always easy rules about this. So, for example, um, there was a kind of an alt-right website that got a lot of um, criticism for supporting uh, presidential candidates. And uh, there was a vulnerability on this site where people used a technique called directed browsing to collect information. And, and direct browsing is just basically editing your URL. You see a number, you change the number without clicking to the website. So you're not using it in the way the website intended. You are now harvesting information. Now, you are not complying with what the website intended you to do to collect information, but are you really hacking that site? And that's where things like, I think the categorical imperative becomes really important for us to ask ourselves. You know, Is it generally acceptable for me to edit my URL bar to get information from the site, You know, even if I'm not supposed to get it? I think most people would probably say yes. Can everybody do it? Yeah, I, I think most people would say yes. So from an ethical perspective, we would look at something like that and say, yeah, you know, that's okay. From a moral perspective, you know, I have no problems about editing my URL bar to access something on a site. I'm not exploiting something. You know, I may be bypassing an intended security mechanism, but I'm doing it in a way that I think complies with most people's interpretations of ethics. You know, it's it's something that I'm always asking myself on on every single pen test, and not even just on pen tests. Writing reports, talking to customers, you know, doing competitive analysis for products, things like that. But but I think it's something that really applies to OSINT as well when we're looking at how we are not only collecting but but applying the information that we're getting to. Yeah. Well, to, and to that point too, if I can if I can add to that, yeah. there was the whole case with Weave where he did exactly that, right? He used the, the IDOR, the insecure direct object reference, force browsing, right? Tons of different names for it where, hey, you wanna buy an iPad, your user ID is seven and changed it to eight, nine, 10, and just grabbed a whole bunch of those and pulled those back, right? And that's the, the exact same situation John uh, Josh was talking about. That went to court, he lost. I think largely he lost, it, it, was, it was later vacated, which sort of makes it irrelevant, but I think he largely lost because he was an absolute terrible racist human being. And the, the, the jury's like, we should really put him away for something, yeah. right? Forget the technical think, piece. But I mean, it, it, it's, it's, 
some of that, and it, it gets from the moral, ethical, fuzzily into the legal piece there, and it, it's a it's a big discussion, yeah. But but I think the categorical imperative still works there. I think. Oh yes. The problem was not the editing of the URL. It's the question of can everybody do this? Can everybody go out, exploit websites, and then start getting? products delivered to them without paying for them? Well, the answer is no. So then we say that would be an unethical action. Can everybody edit the URL bar to get information about posts on an alt-right website that people shared without any expectation of privacy? Yeah, I think we can say that everybody could do that. So I think that it still, you know, requires that evaluation. And in, in that case, you know, it's, uh, a little bit of a different intent and, and, and outcome than, you know, maybe some other examples. And I like what you, what the, that discussion too, because it takes out the ends justifying the means. Cause you might be like, yeah. I completely yeah. disagree with this, the right, the alt right. It's okay. But the AT and T thing, you're like, that's not okay. You're like, why? It's literally the same thing. It's just a different ends. Right. And it, it the, that discussion takes some of that out, which I think is nice. Yeah, you know, we we often talk about Robin Hood, and people think that yeah. you know Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor, and was was a hero of the poor. But according to Kant, that was unethical because we can't have everybody doing what Robin Hood did, and and so you know the. These are rules that they seem simple, and I love rules, right? I'm a, I, you know, I love that I can evaluate something and come up with an answer. It's the wishy-washy stuff in between that I think it's that's really muddy. Well, I appreciate all of this conversation about ethics, and Nico, I wanted to give you a uh, chance to to men to talk about ethics, and then I want to add another piece to it about legality. So, Nico, yeah. I know that you had some things to say here about ethics. Well, not necessarily about ethics, more about when it comes to violating terms of service with a lot of platforms, especially when doing uh, open source intelligence, we, we uh, need sock puppets, right? And a lot of platforms will only give us the information that we're looking for once we set up sock puppets that authenticate to a platform to see the information. Um, my background uh, being a European, we have GDPR that, uh, well, is pretty heavy on privacy. Now, basically, um, prohibits me of gathering information from uh, people, individuals systematically, as well as I'm also violating a task, for instance, when I'm logged into Instagram. With that, it technically makes it impossible for me to do my work, but I still need to do my work. So we need to talk about ethics, we need to talk about morale, uh, goals that we are trying to achieve. So yeah, and with that also comes, uh, I think, the responsibility to not when you um, you are basically creating an entire picture when you're doing open source intelligence, or at least that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find an answer to a question. And with that, I sh often get a complete picture of someone or a group of people. Um, with that comes responsibility to not to disclose that information publicly, for instance, by myself, because it was not initially meant to be aggregated and analyzed and be publicized publicly, because it's scattered around the internet and that's not a complete picture and i see that some people are crossing that line for instance stepping over that line and not always intentionally they're trying to make a point but with with that they're violating other people their privacy well and that's one of the the challenging things i i always loved cybersecurity and web pen testing but you know when i'd come home from work I, it was, I would, I could do CTFs or do things like, you know, web goat and mutility and all those other, you know, vulnerable systems. But I was like, I don't really want to get into bug bounties. I didn't want to get into using my offensive security skills to, to make more money or to do those things. But within the world of OSINT, the, the barrier for entry is so low. It's taking Google queries that we're already running and just using it in a more directed fashion, like Nico says, or, or answering some goal. And so the accessibility of data coupled with the low barrier of entry means that people can start collecting profiles and personas about people. And then the question is, is what do they do with them? They release them, they publish them, because this is not necessarily a professional engagement. This is a hobby engagement. And we're, we're starting to see more of that. People doxing um, other people online uh, just because, well, the data is open. So why can't we do this? Now, 
Josh, uh, actually, John, um, when you're doing a offensive security engagement, you probably have rules of engagement, a scoping meeting with your customer. Can you tell us a little bit about just in general, like what do you talk about to define those rules that you as the tester will follow? Sure. Uh, the first thing is to find out what they're expecting, because really a big piece of that rules engagement process is just getting everybody on the same page. You know, if you go to like a professional sporting event, they'd like to like, this is the foul pole, this is inbounds, out of bounds, right? It's like, these are the rules that we're going to operate by. And when everybody's playing by the same set of rules, the game goes better, right? And then even the person that commits the foul is like, oh, that's right, we agreed to this ahead of time, right? And so you just go through, hey, these are the offensive techniques we see real bad people using. These are the ones that I simulate or can simulate. What do you want me to do, right? I, I can do all of them, okay? Or I can maybe leave this one out because that seems to cross a little bit of the line for you. And so um, it's, it's finding where that level of comfort is. And when you go through that process, so long as you're going through the process with the right people, um, you can get to a point of better understanding what they expect and then meeting that expectation as you do it. Um, as you do those rules of engagement, what you want to do is make sure you gather enough information that one, you find out you've got the actual authority to do it, right? Because that goes back to the, the legality of what we're talking about. Um, and then, uh, I mean, example of that may be going wrong, then I'll let somebody else kind of jump in is uh, there's the, the podcast, the Darknet Diaries tells a great story of the courthouse. And this was the coal fire um, red teamers, pen testers that got caught in the middle of a political snafu, right? Of mm -hmm. just, um, and they're a horrible position, but to some degree, we look at it now and you look at it from a lesson standpoint as a pen tester, they were breaking into a courthouse because the state judiciary in, in Iowa hired them to break into a courthouse. The problem was that a local government or not the state judiciary's most important concept there controlled that courthouse. And so the people that hired them probably didn't have the authority to give them to go do that kind of work. And so making sure that we ask that question, do you have authority to tell me to do this? And then verifying it, right? Um, that keeps us out of trouble and make sure everybody's comfortable with the whole thing going forward. Yeah. And I think that's a, a really, really important point that you made earlier about the foul poles and understanding this is my lane. These are these are the things I need to gather, and this is what I can and can't do. Nico, within the world of open source intelligence, we too have those scoping meetings and all. But would you agree, Nico, that within OSINT, we we many times draw the line because our job is to collect and provide that data instead of acting upon it. For instance, we might use Shodan, as some of you have used Shodan, to find uh, cameras that might be on in some IP address range that's owned by our target. But when we visit those web pages, it might prompt us with a username and password HTTP basic auth login screen. Now, as a pen tester, I know that there are default passwords, admin, 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 camera, whatever, that I could try. But as an OSINT person, I stop right there. Nico, would you agree that that as an OSINT person, we gather and present instead of, and, and we need to know where that, that line is? Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would definitely agree on that. And also what I always try to do with clients I talk with is what if I stumble across something during my investigation that is maybe out of scope, but still is, for instance, um, uh, child abuse uh, material or something else that has that legal risk for me seeing that it could also risk the, my client and company. So that's something, especially when you are searching around the internet, you might stumble on something that you don't want to see and can never unsee again. So that's something that I always want to embed within my goals and scope with clients. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Nico. Now, Josh, you had brought up a point uh, earlier, um, well, before the, the, the live stream about data and correlating and collecting that data and really filtering it, figuring out which is false positives and negatives. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of respect for, for um, Nico and, and Micah and, and people that do OSINT so, so well because I think a lot of people on the outside look at OSINT as 
um, you know, uh, just collecting the information. What is the list of resources that I could use to get the information? But once you look at that, you realize that that just gives you the kind of data like, like uh, Mike, I was talking about earlier. I think the really interesting part is how do I turn all of this volume of data into something that's going to be interesting and useful for me to meet whatever the goals are that I'm trying to accomplish. And a, a lot of that has to do with filtering, but a lot of it has to do with data correlation as well. Uh, any one resource is not going to give you all of the answers, but sometimes it can give you key pieces of information. And then I think it speaks well to the analyst's mindset and their own kind of thought process to be able to take these different sources of information and turn it into something that's really valuable for them at the end. Yep. In, in the 487, we in the class that I wrote, we have we have a, a lab that we work on and it's working with who is data, which you all are very familiar with. It's who owns what websites. And we show in one website how some of the information is present. But if you just go and check that exact same query in another website to look at the who is data, you'll find different data, more detailed data, some of it that actually confirms and some that conflicts with what we saw. So the verification and validation of that data to turn it into information that then can be used to solve a, a question is very important. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, did you guys, uh, did you guys see the Netflix series? Don't F with cats. Of it course. Was, it's it it's was, a staple, um, Josh. We have to. It's, it's a staple, right? It's, it's a little disturbing. It's probably not wise to watch it with young, young children. Um, but uh, I thought that it was uh, really well presented and, and from somebody in a pen testing field watching that the analysts in this uh, documentary used open source intelligence to find answers for, for problems that they were trying to solve. And, and I don't want to spoil their show, but I, I was really impressed with how um, they didn't just use one source of information. It was a lot of analysis. It was a lot of time investment. It was a lot of personal motivation and struggle to be able to solve the, the questions that, that they wanted to answer. And I think at its finest, that, that's what OSINT is. It's, it's using all of those resources and using and applying your own creativity to be able to get to those answers. This is where people working in a team do really well together. Um, I might have some skills in one area, Tim might have some skills in another area, but when we collaborate, I think, uh, you know, particularly in the OSINT area, we can accomplish a lot more too. So let me ask you about that, Josh. Collaboration in a team format. Um, you know, we've all been working in, in the industries for a while, uh, collecting huge amounts of data about some target, some whether it's a website, a domain, a person, and sharing that with other people, that seems to me like the holy grail of we don't have a really good solution for that. In cyber, have you all like figured out a way to to share that data amongst uh, other uh, amongst other testers, amongst other people? Because within the OSINT world, there are some paid investigate uh, case management platforms and all, but you know the the greatest tools and other things from years ago, they just don't seem to scale. So, how do you work with others to share your data? Uh, so what we have done is we just devise a kind of structured data storage and uh, reporting mechanism. We don't use any uh, commercial or open source tools for pen test automation or uh, to kind of store. We've looked at them, but they always kind of seem too much or not enough or not really what we're looking for. You know, I think um, I use grep a lot you know I, I think that's where the linux you know, command. having uh, those command line skills to be able to search through data and then you know we use a lot of markdown just as a very simple markup language to be able to take content and to format it a little bit nicer but still preserve the easy ability to search through it as a simple text document so that's kind of where we've landed consistent directory structure conventions for how we're going to name and, and represent data things like that but you know we're really you know using files synchronized across the file system as opposed to using a more complex uh, data collection tool. All right, uh, Tim, any yeah. thoughts? S same thing. I same mean, thing. Josh summed it up. I mean, it's there's you get benefits from some things, but I find that 
they have just enough detractions that the benefits are typically lost and just go back to go back to ground with the the grep and stuff. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things that I remember from when I was teaching the web hacking class 542 in SANS is we had somebody that brought in Metasploit Pro and they were going to crush the capture the flag. And, you know, they spent literally the first hour to hour and a half setting up the tool, making sure it was working, all the dependencies, getting people, other testers added to the tool, whereas everybody else was almost done with the, with the assessment. So uh, I see your points. Um, we have some uh, some comments here in the in the chat that people are putting in, and thank you to our audience. Uh, this is the first time Josh and Tim, John and Nico and I have gotten together, so we're we're kind of monopolizing the the conversation here. Um, but one of the other things that we wanted to talk about was kind of legality. Now, none of us are lawyers that I know of, right? You're not. None of us are lawyers, so this is not legal advice. But I think my biggest uh, advice to people in OSINT or cyber is get a lawyer. Uh, what do you all think, uh, Tim? I mean, to, to understand what is legal, you are attacking some program that is, you know, in some content delivery network that is across 50 different countries. How do you know what's legal to do in that case? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, I, I short answer is I don't, right? And, and I think, we probably all to some degree say we we come across stuff and we kind of have to guess and and we we feel like hey does this feel dirty um does this feel wrong do what i know basically from this area do i think i mean because we're not lawyers that's not our expertise to get into all that but you know things get a little bit funky um i think nico hit on it some of the aggregation right if i have michael hoffman that's not Protect, protected information. If I have a random 10 digit number, not protected information. Now, if it happens to be Micah's social security number and it, now it's duct taped with Micah, now I have to protect that, right? So that, that aggregation now, if I can start, okay, I've got a name, now I've got an address. Okay, now you can identify someone uniquely and, and it starts to grow and now the, the game changes as we collect more than information. It, you were fine with a random address before. You were fine with a name. You combine those and you add more and now it gets into, you know, those weird scenarios, especially, you know, like in Europe, right, where much stricter privacy concerns and you, you definitely have to be aware of that. But the, I think the short answer is, you know, when in doubt, I think we have to, we have to say this, talk to a lawyer. <laughs> Yeah. And I think relying on our ethics and morals, relying on our teammates to keep us um, in that that safe zone. Um, we always want to push the envelope, especially in offensive security. We want to make sure that we give our customer the best value for their money and, and exploit the systems if we can exploit, whether they're human systems with phishing or social engineering or whether it's actually a physical system. And I think, Tim, you hit it earlier that if we do that with no holds barred, then we're, we're really doing a disservice to our customer. Um, well, there was a, a situation. I, th I think Josh was there as well. We were doing some some work um, and, and we were the, the red team against some some government folks and they were doing some basic OSINT on us. And, and given what they do, there's only so much they can collect. It, Josh is laughing because it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. But but because of what they do, they can't get too much because now it you know violates laws. But they had like, here are Tim's tools. Here are blog posts. Look for this specific tool. Fingerprint this. It was amazing. It was one of the happiest days in my professional career. It was really? so. Oh my god! It was so awesome. It was so awesome. The but I mean, that was we we're on the other side in that case. I mean, I was totally okay with it. But they were hamstrung to a degree. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. The team hacked into the blue team hacked into the camera system and then spied on the red team audio and video while, while we were doing all of our planning and, and all of our engagements. And, and when I found that out at first, I said, you know, wait a minute. And then I was like, okay, yeah, you yeah, gotta, yeah, I, I will. I yeah. will. <laughs> That's right. So, but yeah, this, this brings that. me to a discussion. So op OPSEC and OSINT and OPSEC and offensive stuff. Yeah. That's really mm -hmm. important. That's mm -hmm. something also the legal aspect. So do you protect, how do you protect your client's information and your own information and your own fingerprint? <laughs> it's a hilarious story. It's 
<laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Well, and it's it's really hard over here in the United States. I mean, just to be very honest, Europe, uh, many other countries have rules, have guidelines, have laws that protect companies and people from sharing personal information about other people. And in the United States, we have some, but not nearly as extensive as we need them to be. Um, but uh, I would, uh, so just for the, to end the conversation, we had a, a question over here in there about, do we carry insurance? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, as an OCenter and as a cybersecurity people, person, there's liability, there's errors and omissions, there's other things that we carry just because like Tim, you were saying, you know, you have that feel for where that line is, but your feel for where that line of of legal, not legal, uh, safe, not safe is sometimes different than what your customer has, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think you you absolutely need to carry liability and you know insurance when you're doing any of this kind of work now uh, as a, as a as a paid consultant, right? If you're if you're working for another company that then that's different. But in, in, in a lot of cases now we're seeing customers coming to us and they're asking for significantly greater policy coverage than we've ever seen before. Yes. You know, uh, it, it was not uncommon to have a policy of a, a million dollars, you know, you know, and liability. Now we're seeing requests for eight. And, you know, and in some cases we, we can't even find insurers that will provide that for us. So we have to go back and renegotiate it with customers. But it's it's certainly something that is just a a thing that you need to do as as a consultant in this field. Well, and, and to the insurance point, it's not necessarily even that I do it right. If somebody brings a lawsuit, I mean, you know, we got like eight eight people here at Red Siege. The lawsuit itself could crush us. Just that mm -hmm. done, we're out of business, right? Uh, even with the insurance, if someone brings enough of the heavy handed lawyers, we're we're hosed. Right. Um, so yeah. That was not an invitation for anybody in our audience. It was just a hypothetical thing there. It was just a, um, well, what, to get back to open source intelligence, uh, one of the things that Nico mentioned earlier and kind of hinted at was access. Access, you know, uh, Nico, before I was in open source intelligence, when I was in cyber, I didn't create sock puppet accounts, or if I did, they were just light sock puppet accounts just to get me access to some platforms. But within the open source intelligence world, what I've learned is that these investigators have a lot of access into many different platforms. I thought I knew how to do reconnaissance. Then I went into OSINT and I figured out that I kind of knew how, but I didn't nearly know how to do it uh, much like uh, somebody like you, Nico, who's who's got accounts in Telegram and all these other places where people are talking about interesting things, whether it's I'm going to attack this website or I'm going to um, uh, share these credentials on the dark web. Nico, do you find that that one of the main differences in OSINT and OFSEC is is access to, to that open source data? Um, yeah, I think it's more that, that red teaming, or, or at least the people who are in red teaming that I know of are do more things in, re in retrospect. So they get a task and then they build their suck puppets and do that stuff. And I position myself in all kinds of fields with my suck puppets. So I am uh, far right. I'm far left. I'm everything in the middle. I'm uh, a hacker. I'm, I'm a, a, a child abuser. I'm well, not I'm not, but <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, you have I'm the basically profiles every, that. I'm every profile. I, I had at a certain moment in time, I had over 300 profiles. And with that comes an entire new job, maintaining them, maintaining your operation security, maintaining their backstopping stories and everything. That's a task by itself. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then to, to the point you brought up before, like your level of OSINT and the people that you're looking at are drastically different than mine, right? Like if somebody finds out I'm looking up information for a pen test, whoop de friggin' do. You're chasing down, you know, a, a molester. They could actually quite literally come kill you, right? Yeah. Like there's a, a, a world of difference between my requirements for OSINT and yours. Like if I leak my home address, whoop de do. I'm the only Timidine on the planet and no one's gonna come after me anyway. Yours, drastically different. So that that's a very interesting point. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I, funny story. I actually was in the Telegram group where there were, let's say, over 
20 jihadis trying to plan attacks on a place in the world from which at least half of them were some type of intelligence, including me. But they were literally also debating on, hey, if we know that someone in this group is snitching on us, we will find them and we'll kill them and we will kill their entire families. And that was not just making fun. They were dead serious about that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, guys, for that wonderful end to the conversation there. Bring it home back to the, hey, we will kill all of you. Yes, thanks. That's the internet, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Well, um, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, anything else that you want to bring up about open source intelligence, offensive security, uh, John Gorham flow? Uh, thanks for being on. Do you have anything else you want to say? I think I covered so much, but like one of the things that I think like themes I kind of took away from everybody and it kind of reinforces what I've seen is just the importance of the analysis and using sound logic and reasoning to draw the conclusions that we do and the inferences that we make and uh, being able to do that well, right? And then supporting information for that. Uh, so throwing your personal preferences and opinions out as you do the, the research and that kind of stuff and get to the, the truth of the matter, so. Absolutely. It was so much easier when when I was dealing with IPs and domains and websites because those are kind of very cut and dry, very, very easy to understand. Once you start bringing in human behavior and trying to understand, I remember one time I was I was researching a person that had gotten a lot of phishing emails. So I was doing more blue team. I was analyzing this person's persona to find out why they were a target. And I tell students this in my class. I, I saw their Facebook profile and it was it, my target uh, male and his wife and three adult children. And then I just pivoted to his Instagram account and it was the same male, my target. And then it was a different woman and three younger children. I was like, oh, he's cheating on his wife. This is the double life. And all. it turned out it was his sister and his sister's kids. It was, it was simple, but yeah, some of those those logical um, fallacies and the, yeah. the biases come into play, John. Well, good point. And thank you for being on. Yeah, no problem. Josh Enjoy Wright, it. thank you for being on. Anything else you want to bring up here? Just, uh, I wanted to bring up the importance of OSINT as an analysis task when you're doing a security engagement, not just at the beginning. A lot of the time we look at kind of reconnaissance, scanning, exploitation, post-exploitation, and then we think of it as a line. But uh, I think OSINT is such a valuable tool, not just at the beginning of the engagement, although that's normally where it starts, but also coming back to that information again and again. Uh, as a pen tester, we will often go into engagement knowing a little bit about an organization. OSINT tells us more information, but as we start to exploit systems, we learn more and more that information then fields the OSINT loop as well. So, you know, being able to continue applying OSINT, not just at the very outset of any kind of an assessment, vulnerability scan or pen test, what have you, but also repeating that process over and over, continuing to reuse what we've learned, really improves the value uh, proposition of, of the OSINT that you can collect. I love that idea that it, that, you know, when, when, when I was doing pen tests, we always talked about reconnaissance, discovery, mapping, exploitation, post-exploitation. It was this, this process. And yeah, we had these little loops sometimes, but I love your idea that the more we learn, the more it feeds our requirements gathering, the more it feeds our additional uh, data sources that we need to then query. And so we get smarter and do better. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate you having you. me on. Nico Dakins, thank you for being on here. Any last words from you, sir? No, I always enjoy listening to people outside of open source intelligence because it really opens up my mind to see how I can learn from people who are doing the offensive stuff, learning about uh, enumerating URLs again. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's so important for me to find more information. So, yeah, for me, again, it's always an eye opener to talk to guys like Josh, John, and Tim. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate you being on here with me. I always uh, like hearing your points of view and uh, what you've got going on too. So thank you. Thank you. Tim Adine, thank you so much for sharing some of your time with us. Uh, any last words from you? Yeah, it, it, I, what I find most interesting with this uh, and just social engineering, the whole OSINT, whatever, there was a fantastic podcast a number of years ago. I think it was the social engineering podcast. The neat thing was, is they talked to a bunch of people in different industries Think, like information I didn't know, like 
a magician and redirection and stuff like that. So for example, like Nico here, he does OSINT at a level that is so far beyond what I can do or, or frankly need to do. But I can get so much useful information from just this conversation with him. So, you know, find those people who are just way beyond and, and try to grab some of those crumbs to, uh, to, to make you better at what you do. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And and I uh, appreciate all of you, you know, sharing your time with us and uh, our audience as well. Um, one resource I'll throw out there, it's a nonprofit organization that Nico and I run called OSINT Curious, OSINTCurio.us. Um, free open source intelligence blogs, videos that show you a lot of the techniques and the tips that we use um, in our field. And I think that, Tim, you you kind of brought it up very succinctly there that that when we're doing OSINT, we usually are going deeper, a lot deeper than than what we were doing when I was doing OFSEC. When I was doing OFSEC, the fact that this developer that made this application I was hacking knew Python and this and that, that informed the things I did, but now the, the things in OSINT, we, we take it to a whole nother level. So um, again, thank you for all for being on uh, and thank you to our audience. Um, this has been the OSINT Plus series. Next month, we are going to have OSINT Plus Digital Forensics and Incident Response. That's right, DFER. So come and meet with us on June 29th as I and another OSINT instructor and two, uh, two digital forensics people talk about how we use OSINT within the DFER world. And for now, I'd like to say thank you to everybody and have a great day.